everybody. I'm Bryn, the person behind Teach English in Rome, and today I'm chatting with Marcia de Salvatore, and I'll let her introduce herself. So hi, Marcia. It's so good to have you here. Thank you for having me. I am sweating, so I've got a fan in my face because it's super hot in Rome. But anyways, my name is Marcia de Salvatore, or in America, Marcia de Salvatore. Um, I live in Rome. I'm from Cincinnati. I'm an English teacher, but I'm also a comedian. Um, I started an English comedy show about 11 years ago in Rome, so I do that. Obviously, that's not a full-time job, but my full-time job is teaching English in Rome. And I think um, the one of the reasons why I was so excited to collaborate with you is because you contacted me first from the Rome's Comedy Club Facebook page, yeah. and I thought, what a perfect combination, combining comedy with teaching. Um, so has that been, what has your experience been combining, being both a, a stand-up comedian and an English teacher? Well, I think that when you teach, you kind of use some theater, um, either facial expressions or gestures or even coming up with funny role plays or I think you can use a lot of theater in general. And then I tend because my my thing is comedy. So I use a lot of comedy techniques in my class. I do a lot of funny like improv dialogues and just improv techniques, getting them up, warming them up. I, I do I actually do do an improv, proper improv class for my students. And it's a blast because it doesn't matter, even with limited vocabulary, it doesn't even matter the level. You can do so many fun things. Like, you know, there's an improv game where you just have to say your name and like how you're feeling. So you'd be like, I'm Marsha, I'm hot. Like you don't need a lot. You could be a basic student. So I use a lot of like techniques, but um, a lot of comedy is that um, I'm very good at like, uh, you know, as a comedian, you have to like read your audience. So if something is not working, you have to be flexible to be like, oh, that joke isn't working. So let me change the direction of my story or my joke. Well, in my classes, I'm like that. Sometimes you've got a student that is not talking, another student that is talking a lot, somebody that's in the middle. So you have to be able to like read your audience and be like, hey, student who's not talking, let's get you to talk. And the one over here, you're talking, you're great. But, you know, try to, you've got to, you know, make sure that every student, now obviously if you have 20 students in the class, I've never had that many. The most I've had maybe is 10, maybe no, not even 15. Well, maybe when I taught at a high school once, but you know, you have to be able as a teacher, like a comedian, read your audience. You don't want to leave a student behind because they're shy. They need more attention. They need you. You need to be flexible about that. I think, you know, obviously every teacher has their strong points. I'm used to, because of comedy, I'm used to gauging an audience and being flexible and being creative, coming up with stuff. Um, but it's techniques that you can learn, you know, they're nothing, it's nothing hard. So I, I feel that comedy, definitely um, being a comedian has helped me become uh, a better teacher, definitely more spontaneous. Um, uh, and being able to, you know how many times I get asked questions and I literally do not know the answer. Like when they're like, why is the pronunciation like this with this word and like this? And I, I honestly don't know. I honestly don't know. <laughs> right. Do you know what I mean? I'm sorry. And so I, you for years would just shame myself. I would go into this dark hole of like, you're stupid. What's wrong with you? You're a teacher. How can you call yourself a teacher? I would literally shame myself because I felt dumb. And then I was like, wait a minute. I'm not a linguistics or, it, uh, or I never even did. I don't have a PhD in English. So being able to use other tools like, hey, you know, being able to be like spontaneous and finding other answers. You know, I don't know the answer to that, but I can get back to you or Jerry, you have to have that because you aren't God. We aren't the God of the lesson. We know a lot more than they, but, you know, I had to learn that too, because, um, you know, and then sometimes even with comedy, sometimes something doesn't work for a certain person, you can't take it to heart. Like you can do the best you can. That's that's what you're there. You have to do the best you can, but also sometimes you'll have this student who's like, doesn't want to be there and there's nothing you could do. And it does, it kind of brings you down. And I would go into this cave too, that it took years of practice, but you know, they'd just be like, their company probably paid for their course. They're not in the mood. What do you do? You can't take it to heart, just try the best you can. If not, they just gotta go, <laughs> move on, you know, so. 
that's pretty much how I use, I think, comedy and theater in general while teaching. I, you touched on so many important points when you were um, talking just now. I, I think the first follow-up question that I want to ask you is, you mentioned that there's certain points of improv um, that um, people can learn. Um, and I'm really interested in that because like I said to you previously, I don't consider myself a particularly funny person, but having taught for 10 years, I, I mean, I think anyone who's taught for such a long time or even just a year, you have to see the humor in situations mm -hmm. because like you said, you don't know everything and they will ask you a lot of questions you don't know. So you have to be able to roll with the punches. So if somebody um, is listening to this and they're thinking, oh, I wish I could use humor to lighten a situation, but sometimes I just don't know what to do. What would you say to that person? Um, well, first of all, humor is that you're not trying too hard. In fact, anyone that you go see improv or comedy that's trying too hard to win over, it's not going to work. So the best thing is to be naturally, natural, relaxed and in the moment, which is the big rule number one of improv, right? You have to be in the moment and that's how you roll with the punches better. Because if you're not, or if you're in your head going, oh my God, I suck. I didn't know the answer to that you're not gonna be able to handle the situation. They're gonna know, you're gonna feel shit, excuse my language. Um, so it's really important to be present and to be completely natural and never to try to be funny. People are funny unexpected when they're not trying or you have, and you'll notice the more in the moment you are, the more of like, a lot of times, you know, I make my students laugh. Like yesterday we did a, a conversation class, an airport vocabulary. And then I didn't know what to do for the last exercise because after you do airport vocabulary, you know, oh, let's do a fake check-in. Then I didn't know what to do. So I'm like, everyone tell a funny airport story. Yeah. It just came to me because in that moment, I was like, oh my God. I was like, started panic. I was like, I have 20 minutes left to this class. My itinerary did not, I turned my, my lesson plan didn't work out according to plan because they already knew the vocabulary. Everybody knows airport vocabulary. And I was like, I don't know why. So when I was in the moment and I remember I said, we've all been to the airport, right? Oh my God, what's the funniest airport? You know what I mean? Because I was in the moment because I could have definitely spiraled into like, um, I suck. I wasn't prepared. I didn't, pre you know what I mean? So there you go. And then it was hilarious. We were cracking up from like, silly check-in, bad English stories, all these kinds of things. And it turned out to be an awesome class. And so there you go. That was a total impromptu because I remained present and took a moment and stopped criticizing myself. And there you go. I think that's so perfect because I, I in my experience, the biggest um, time sucker can be planning a lesson. Um, and thinking I have to plan every part of the lesson. But then um, I think it's an important um, thing to point out that really the goal of um, the goal that most people have of taking any language class is knowing how to communicate better. And yeah. so you don't need to have everything perfect. If you are human and being yourself and you get the um, and you get the students communicating more, then they can they can lead the lesson with their level of English and then they're accomplishing their goal of practicing communicating more. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, making lesson plans. That's another thing about, you know, improv. You don't know how a scene is gonna go, so you have to be completely like in the moment and be able to reroute. And with lesson plans, you can have a lesson plan that rocks from the minute you start till the end, you're like, oh, yeah. And then you, have, I had one, it was a Valentine's day and I had a great class, but I don't remember my exercise. Oh, it was writing a, um, a love letter. Oh my God, it bombed. <laughs> In like two seconds, hi husband, I love you. And I was like, well, no, I was thinking maybe more or less. I guess I didn't really set up the act and we were done in like 10 minutes. And I was like, that was not. And I freaked, and then it, then I just, of course, am able to be like, okay, well, let's just talk about fun. You know, there are moments where, like, you think something's going to work, and it doesn't. So what are you going to do? Panic? <laughs> to try to figure out, you know, something. That was hard. I have to say, I, don't, I didn't quite recover that one. That was a bad example. 
that was bad. I, yeah, I think all, all teachers have examples of that, that a lesson plan doesn't go as you planned. And, um, and it took three times as long to plan it as it did to actually give it. Um, and then it wasn't a good lesson after all. <laughs> so oh, what are you going like, to do? <laughs> you're like, you're going down the quicksand. You're like, I have 35 minutes to fill. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Staring at you and you're like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So I'm talking to you now about your experience based on um, now being um, an English teacher that knows what they're doing. And then we can see in the background Rome's Comedy Club um, uh, logo and in, in the background that you're presenting on now on Zoom. Um, but it hasn't always been like that. So can you take us back to before you were the founder of Rome's Comedy Club and before you were an English teacher in Rome that knew what you were doing, um, yeah. what, what did this all begin as for you? Well, let's start, first start with English teacher because I got into comedy because of teaching. So I was very lucky that I came to Rome basically with a job already. I had met an American guy from Ohio like me in Perugia where I studied Italian and he was moving with his partner to Rome. And he says, contact me because I, you know, if you need a job or anything, I'm going now. I was like, oh no, I don't want to move to Rome. A year later, I did end up moving to Rome like he had predicted. And he says, I work for a school, come in, I'm the director. So I was very, very lucky. I did that week, I remember when I moved to Rome, I did know that I had that, but I also was curious what was going on. So I think I went to Berlitz and maybe a British school. Um, Berlitz paid awfully. I was like, really, is that what teachers make here? I was in shock. I was like, I couldn't live, I couldn't even eat, I don't think. So then British school wasn't bad, but I just remember the school was really like dark and sad. It was on the fourth floor. It just, I don't know. It didn't give me a really good vibe. And then I went to his school and it was gorgeous called Wall Street English with all glass, all the um, classes you could see through the, they were all just open window, open, not open space. I mean, they were divided and it just was really fun. There was like a computer lab where students were studying and then it was a very interactive school. So I was very lucky. Um, the one thing I will say is that the hours in the school were not enough. So they said, well, you could do out of school lessons. And that's when life got really complicated because to make they still didn't pay great. Rome in general as a whole doesn't pay their teachers enough. So you have to do lots of stuff. So you got to take whatever you can get. So I was teaching in school. I had a scooter. I was doing company classes all around the city. Then I was doing private lessons. And so my life was crazy. Like the best thing that I invested in was a scooter because I would start my day in like if any Rome, if people are in Rome, we're going to know this. At one end of the city in Aor, then I would go to the Prenestina, uh, which is like east side. Then I would go to Chinichita. Then I'd go home for lesson. It was crazy, but I, that was the only way to make ends meet. You know, you have to do stuff. The only way that I know that teachers get by is because they have a really good contract with one school. And they're hard to come by. Yeah, can you talk about the contracts with the schools? Because I understand that, well, like you just said, that they're hard to come by. So if you yeah. are um, trying to figure out how to get a job where you're happy um, at a school in Rome, um, what I am telling people is that um, you should talk to people that work at that school, uh, try to find them either in person or online and see what the deal is. Um, but then, um, I think that if people understood what the, what the choices are for having a contract or being like an independent, um, yeah. teacher, what does that look like? So there's a few options. You can be a freelance and you open a partita Eva, so you pay your own taxes and that's how you make the most money. I know people that have partita Eva that are completely freelance. They get students by word of mouth, or maybe they used to work for a company through another school. And sometimes the company will say, look, it's cheaper for us to just pay you than to go through your school. Sometimes they'll do that. I know that's completely illegal, but I'm sorry, it happens. I'm going to be realistic. Students, 
maybe will then ask you like, do you want to go private? Cause they pay half, you know, and you make more money. So anyways, there's people who have partita Eva, which is like the tax and you pay your own taxes and you're completely freelance. Then you have Coco Co, which is a freelance contract, but you're hired without any obligations of the company to pay your holiday or vacation. And that's the most common is Coco Co. Most schools offer that. It means they're not totally responsible for you, but they do pay you. Yeah. And so it's good. Then you have Contrato Indeterminato, which is a long term contract. That's great. You don't get paid a lot, but you get a 13th bonus in the year, you get sick leave, you get holiday, and you get um, promised a certain amount of hours, right? Uh, those are pretty much, and then there's like contracts that pay you completely under the table. So there's like no taxes. And a lot of schools do do that in Italy. Italy is notorious for under the table work. Those are harder though nowadays. When I first started, like under the table was a lot of schools. Now, they get into big trouble. So they have to give you probably the Coco Co. Then the Indeterminato, those are almost really impossible. Those are only if you get hired staff positions like director of studies, like at British school or at my school, if you're a service manager and you also teach, then you can get those kinds of contracts or with an international school. I believe they have proper contracts. Um, but then I know other people that have this partita Eva and they're happy, they're flexible, they move around, they do what they want to do, they have their timetable, they work when they want to work. It just depends what you, what your needs are. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for explaining that because, um, I've talked to several people that, um, either know what the situation is like, and then there's other people that are contacting me, um, and they're very confused about everything. Um, and I, um, I think it's just the best to talk to people that have experienced yes. all of this, um, so you can get their stories and, and really know, um, what they recommend because they've lived it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you also touched upon a common challenge that I think a lot of English teachers face is that, um, when they're working for a school, they're sent all around the city. Um, to different businesses. Mm -hmm. And that's what my situation was like as well when I was teaching there. I honestly, I loved my students and I loved going into the businesses and helping them um, with their English classes. It was probably the most enjoyable job that I've had, but mm -hmm. um, it was so challenging getting there on time because I wouldn't have enough time between my classes always to and especially if the, the time that I was supposed to be traveling was over lunchtime, <laughs> I wouldn't have enough time to um, leave one place that I was working, eat lunch. I would eat lunch standing up at a bar and then get to the next place. And um, I, didn't have, um, I didn't have a scooter. Um, and so I had to rely on the mass transportation. And if I had to take a bus and it was late, I mean, it was... Um, it was, it was not a good situation. So I think pointing out that you kind of, you do need a scooter if you're going to be um, sent to these different locations um, to teach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I agree. Scooters, either you're lucky and you stay in one place or, or you get stuff all in the neighborhood. Sometimes that can happen. There's a school and they might have things nearby or you got to get a scooter. You cannot rely on public transport and have lessons all around the city. You all, there's no way you'll. Mm -mm. Yeah, I know. And so that's that's one thing that um, was just a exhausting. Um, yeah, it was exhausting, and it was not a good situation. So um, I'm one of the goals of teaching of the teaching English from Rome website is so someone else doesn't have to get in that situation because. Um, <laughs> I didn't exactly know what to do about it uh, or to make it better unless I got a scooter, but I wasn't completely comfortable with that idea either um, because I thought, um, well, if I get hit, <laughs> that will um, that will be yeah, really that's, dangerous. Yeah, no, having a scooter is not easy. It's really scary and dangerous. But I, I, I remember I had no, I felt like, because I lived far from the school and I just, yeah. No, it's not easy. The scooter is dangerous in Rome. 
Yeah. So um, when we chatted earlier, you told me that you have, um, you've taught in a couple different situations. Mm -hmm. You um, started teaching with Wall Street English, but then you've also taught independently. Is that, is that? Yeah, what, okay. yeah that's correct. So I started with Wall Street and then at the time their management was very bad and the school went under. So I was on unemployment, but in that time I started to build up First of all, comedy, I boomed. I, I was having shows and I was traveling with it. So I utilized that time off uh, gathering students in the neighborhood, putting stuff up on Facebook. I did little bits like I taught it at an after school, high school to teachers that wanted to learn English. Like I was doing bits and bobs because I had this time, I wasn't doing anything full time. And so after that, after a while, then unemployment gave up and that wasn't enough. I then taught with a company and I was able to just work two days a week and it was 16 hours and two days. And the rest of the week I was open for shows and all that stuff. And that was good. It was exhausting, but it was only two, to, two days a week. Then I would do a private every once in a while, et cetera. And that was, I really liked that. But, um, I like the flexibility with that. And then under my house, they opened Wall Street again because it was the new management. And so because I was tired of the company course was in Tivoli, which is about 40 minutes by car. And I was tired also of teaching from home. And so they opened downstairs and I'm like, how can I not? I literally walk downstairs and I go to work. So those are my three. I mean, when I first moved here, like I said, I worked on Wall Street, but to make money a little bit more, I had to do privates and go out and I was traveling a lot. Then after that, I said, no, I am in my mid thirties. I'm tired. So I can't go around the city. And so then I was lucky to find this situation at Tivoli, which was two days a week. And then I had freedom to do other bits and bobs. And now I'm down to just working at Wall Street that's under my house. So, I mean, how convenient is that? And uh, private lessons. So I've had, I had the full-time job. I did have Tempo Indeterminato, but they went bankrupt. And that was nice. I always had security. Then I went from then unemployment to like bits and bobs, let's say freelance all over the place, pretty much under the table as well to now I have Coco Co, which is freelance, but the school pays me regularly. Okay. But not that, holiday. That sounds like an amazing situation where you have a um, you have a pretty good setup with the school and you don't have to go far. You just go what downstairs to go to work. Crazy. That's I'm literally I can't even escape and then the whole neighborhood is my students. So it's like hi, hi. Oh. <laughs> It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. But I love it. I love it. It's literally downstairs. So yeah, yeah now I'm awesome. working online half because of the quarantine and everything. A lot of students moved to online. They don't want to go back to being in the school. So I have online or I go downstairs. So my life is very easy. I don't move a lot though, which is not good. <laughs> yeah. Not um, a lot of cardio going on, but yes. Yeah. Well, and I think so many people are in that situation right now. Um, I have created a working situation where I don't have to, I don't have to go many places, but now with the pandemic, I can't go many places. And yeah, so it works it's, out. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. It, it, it worked out perfectly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I do kind of wish I could get out a little bit more, but um, yeah. one day. Yeah. So tell us about Rome's Comedy Club. Oh yeah, so then comedy, I met a student while teaching at Wall Street, the first Wall Street, who was an actor. And he's like, teacher, you are so funny, you need to do acting. So I thought I wanted to have a free time activity. So I started doing acting classes in Italian, which was great for my Italian, but, and I also did some stuff in English as well. There's an English theater of Rome with Gabby Ford. Um, and so I was doing some classes and like every time there was like a dramatic role I'd have to do, and people would just laugh. They're like, you know, you just can't be dramatic. You're too funny. So I then was like, well, I'd like to do stand up. And a friend who was, who is an actor and lives here, he's British. He says, well, then you'll have to just start it. And I'm like, really? So I did, I started a stand up show because I wanted to try stand up personally for my reasons. 
And then it evolved into like this amazing project in my life. It has been the most satisfying, amazing thing I could have ever done in my life. It is the most beautiful, exciting, at times challenging. First of all, re rewarding for me as a, as a comedian, I love doing stand-up. It's my high, it's my zen, it's my everything. I love it as a stand-up, but the project has brought so many amazing, beautiful people into my lives, the performers. Then to the audience, I love my audience. I have a following and it's just been so rewarding. And it's one time a month, every last Friday of the month. It has been for the last 11 years. And every, I look, I look forward to that Friday every month. It's like the big party of the month. It's so much fun because all these foreigners, also a lot of Italians now come, they just want to have a good time. And it's not like, it's not like when you go to the, like the, co the comedy cellar in New York, people go in and they're like, oh, this, this comic is better be funny. You know, it's the comedy center, central. It's, comedy set cellar is like where Chris Rock, Amy Schumer, people have expectations. And if you don't do a great job, they probably are going to heckle you be back. Here in Rome, people just want to have a good time. So we're going to have some comedians as normal that aren't great. But the audience is so warm and loving because they're like, we're in Rome. You know what I mean? Like, we're lucky to have stand-up in English. So that also creates such a beautiful community and so much fun. And I couldn't be proud. I've met the most amazing humans from this project. Watching them go from, like, never doing stand-up to being, that's probably what they should be doing for their job. Like, if they were in America. Like, just amazing. So... So you said that, um, you said previously that um, the, the funniest situations are just when you're um, kind of being yourself. And then yeah. um, you said to me that you use your own life um, in yeah. your stand-up routine. Um, yeah. So is there, what would you say that your audience finds the funniest about um, kind of your own backstory of being Italian-American living in Rome? Yeah, they love my family, my mother. I think this whole city knows my mother is so mad. She's like, I don't like to come to now, Rome. Everyone thinks I'm stupid. <laughs> and my mother is like the sellout. Every time I do a bit, people love my mom because she's this tragic Calabrian. She's so funny. Like, you know, my all time classic Marsha joke is my mom going, Marsha, why don't you have a husband? You think I like your father? No, but he's a nice man. I'm a nice woman. Like she's just, she just says things like all, you know, just comes out of her mouth and she's just so funny. And so I just talk about her all the time and they love it. That I think my probably three biggest selling points are my family uh, living in Rome. So even the Romans think that it's hilarious because I show them a perspective they've never thought of like, they never thought about like when you go to the grocery store and you're paying and they're like, don't you have chains? Like no one in this city has changed. I don't know if you remember that from living. Like it'll be like 20 euro and you pay with a 50 and they're like, oh my God, they can't process giving you change for that. So like something like that, because I present it like an Italian be like, oh my God, we never knew that like that's funny but we live it so they don't see it so I you know I have my, the Italian following that I have love it because I show them the side of Italy and Rome that they're like oh my god you know and then the third selling point is dating now mm -hmm. I'm not dating I have a relationship I talk about him a lot and people love that dating tinder Italians versus American so those are usually the, the big three big ones. I don't do politics or anything. I'm a storyteller, so that's why. But those are my probably hot sellers. Yeah, because I'm, I don't live in Rome and I don't know your mother, but I think yeah, the way you described her, um, I, I can think of women in my life. Actually, I can hear my own mother, my own yes. Italian mother saying the same Old thing mother. that your mother says. And then my Italian American grandmother, she wouldn't say that to me, but she would imply it. <laughs> yes. Um, and so, yeah, I, I can definitely identify with that. Yeah, no, absolutely. They, I think it's not, it's just the mother daughter relationship too, you know, um, 
uh, uh, you know, it's just the relation. Mothers are very honest with their daughters. I mean, it depends. Everyone's different, but they can somehow relate. They know someone like that. So if it's not that you're, you get along with your mom in that way, like, you know, my mom is like brutally honest all the time. Like, mom, how do I look in this dress? She's like, well, you know, you were never very slim. <laughs> Kenny, so you don't have to have the Italian mom. It's just the uh, the brutally honest mom that you're like, really, that was not necessary. Yeah. So I think a lot of people just relate to that sort of relationship. So. So I think the um, hearing you talk about Rome's Comedy Club and all of the amazing experiences that you that you've had with it, um, someone might be thinking, well, that sounds amazing, but I have. I, and I would love to have that kind of experience, but I have no idea how to get started with something like that. And yeah, so stand up, yeah. not to think that someone could repeat your same steps in what you did with Rome's Comedy Club, but what would you say that someone should keep in mind if they want to do a, a big project that they are really passionate about? and would possibly change how they see the world around them? What, like, what should they keep in mind? Well, Rome is tough, so it's not easy, but I believe in anything in life, if you really want to do something, you can make it happen. You have complete control in deciding to do it or not, yes? So if you decide that that's what you want to do and your heart is in it, you can make it happen. I don't believe, like, I can't, no, you can, full stop. That's just an excuse of either laziness or you're not confident, you're insecure. So whatever it is, you have the control over making things happen. Now, it's not easier. It's easier, like I'm a go-getter, I'm a networker, I talk to people. Like, So that part of my personality kind of just fits in with getting shit done, excuse my language, right? Other people are a little bit slow about stuff like that. But you have to remember, just keep that in mind. Like, if that is what you want to do, you have to make it happen. Like, I have such a hard time. Um, and I have a friend who is my comedy guru. She was a comedian in, in America, pretty successful. And then she moved to Rome because she got married to an Italian. And she's been my guru because sometimes I'm like, oh, I don't want to write new material. Can't someone write it for me? And she's like, no. She's like, do you want to just be a talking head? No. You have to create it. And I'll be like, oh, I don't like social media. Well, then I guess then you're not going to have anybody come to your show if you're not going to be able to check. Like, this is it. If you want to make it happen, you have to make it happen, right? You've got to put all your love and effort. And um, that's all I can say really is that we have more power than we give ourselves credit. It's just that a lot of us don't want to use that power. And again, I repeat, it's not easy for someone. Like someone, I just use my boyfriend, for example. He's very slow. He's not a networker. He's a musician. And I'm always like, why don't you do this and this and this? It's hard for him. Like it's, he doesn't have that personality. He has the passion. He's not like a good, it's hard for him. So I'm not saying everyone is cut out to make things happen. But if you truly believe in something, you've got the power. I that's that's such a powerful statement to say and um i really hope that people are listening to this that they really take that to heart um and i think that when someone figures out what they really want to do and they set their mind to it it's amazing what can happen it's um, when you know when you find it i never knew i had this into me but i loved the first time i did stand up i'm like this is it i found my voice and it's amazing that even though I say take control, it's almost not even control. It's almost because you really want to do it. So sometimes it's finding that one thing and realizing, yeah, it sounds like, oh my God, it sounds like a lot of work. It's not because if you love it, it's just like cake. So did you have this big plan of what you were going to arrive to at the, at, like, at the end of this journey? Um, or you were just doing the next step as it felt right to you? Not because it was such a strange project that I was like, oh, this is not going to fly. And then it was crazy. It just every month, more audience, more people wanted to try stand up. Um, and then we had to move to a bigger venue. I all, well, another word of advice is I'm very grounded. 
I have lots of ideas, but I keep it very minimal. I never go on, go beyond extremes. I never talk too far ahead. I kept it always grounded. And I still do. That's why I'm only one time a month because it keeps it grounded, right? I don't get too overexcited. I don't over plan. So that's another thing. That's me personally. I keep things very minimal. So that's why I didn't know what to expect that it would get to this point. Because every year I'd just be like, oh, I'm lucky. That's great. Let's go to a bigger place. Let's go. Every once in a while, we did do two shows a month because we would sell out and people were booking. And so, um, but no, I didn't know. Um, and so, yes, I don't know. And the future could be, you know, I would like now the pandemic has killed everybody's <laughs> passion. I would like to do comedy classes, improv classes and grow with that. But right now everything's on hold, so. Yeah, I think, yeah, you said it so well. Everything is on hold. So um, one last question that I'd like yeah. to ask you is, if you look back on your journey um, teaching English in Rome and looking at everything that you've done living in Rome, is there one thing that you wish you'd known about earlier? Gosh, no. I'm sure there is. Wow, you got me. No, I get. I wish that I would have maybe have met someone like you that was doing what you were doing, right? Teaching, like showing people like the example, like the tools we have today, social media, your kind of forum, giving information is so helpful. I mean, I came when it was 2001. I had just opened an email account. I mean, I remember it was really scary. And then like giving your CV and just the resources, I think now. So, um, uh, yeah, I think maybe just having more resources, but it's amazing how we still got on with it. I mean, you still came to Italy not having, you know, I remember I just showed up. There was no like, remember we had to actually get a map to find where we were going? <laughs> Yeah, and then if you, uh, yeah, I remember being so lost that at one point I was looking at the map upside down, and I was like, why can't I find where I need to go? Oh yeah, I, I carried a paper map with me in my backpack that went everywhere with me, um, and I was so happy that um, I finally learned the city um, and all the places that they were sending me. I was so happy when I could actually one day leave my map at home. Yes. Oh my God. That was crazy. So yeah, I guess if I could go back and I need something that would have been helpful then. I mean, that's really it because I don't know, there's nothing else that I would change because it was just kind of the journey of living here is just not knowing and not, uh, the one important thing is that I give that to anybody moving abroad is never comparing where you're from to where you are. I would spend just crying like why doesn't this work why is the customer service like this and it, you're not going to go very far just you are here things work this way so you either adopt or you don't like it then you got to leave that that's pretty much it because there's nothing you can do get ready to wait at the post office for an hour then you get up there and they're like i don't know you know there were some days i really but then a lot of that stuff really came in handy called uh, tragedy plus time equals comedy. So there you go. Yeah. Rome comedy club. Most material comes yeah. from wanting to kill someone. Yeah, a that's a really good point. Time. Yeah. So I think that's an excellent point to end on to um, remind people that um, you are not home anymore. Um, just remember that you are living in Rome and you um, you have to get used to how they do things. Um, yeah. It'll make things so much easier for you. Yes, you're gonna get less stressed and just make it funnier because you're not, it's just not gonna win That's the situation, so. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you to for chat having me. me, this was fun. It was fun, I hope that I'm giving information to that young version of me that moved here 20 years ago. Um, oh, I'm yeah. sure, That's yeah. What you're doing. Yeah, I think you gave great information and I really wish you the best of luck in everything that Thanks, you do. And I better meet you in person in Rome. I would Rome. 
I would love that. Next time I can actually leave the country and yeah. um, Italy will, will take my passport. <laughs> yes, 